Greetings, and welcome to today's Healthcare Provider Program brought to you by Living Beyond Breast Cancer. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. This webinar is being recorded. I would now like to turn the program over to your host, Stephanie Washburn. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Healthcare Provider Program on developing trust, inclusivity, and a welcoming clinical space for patients from the LGBTQIA cancer community. We're glad you could join us. My name is Stephanie Washburn, and I'm the Manager of Healthcare Provider Outreach at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, or LBBC. I'm pleased to serve as your moderator today. In case you're just getting to know us at LBBC, we're a national nonprofit organization that offers trusted information and a community of support to people affected by breast cancer. This program is part of LBBC's Young Women's Initiative, which provides resources tailored to meet the specific needs of young people diagnosed with breast cancer before age 45. This initiative began in 2011 when we were awarded a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to expand our programming. This CDC funding continues today. We selected today's topic because of its importance to people with breast cancer and healthcare providers alike. Our speakers, Dr. Chandler Cortina and Dr. Jul Dr. Julian Sanchez, will help us understand the unique barriers experienced by the LGBTQIA cancer community and offer ways to cultivate a safe space in healthcare environments. We thank Dr. Cortina and Dr. Sanchez for sharing their time and expertise with us today, and you'll learn more about them shortly. We'd like to draw your attention to several LBBC resources that we hope will be helpful to you. Please visit lbbc.org backslash LGBTQ hyphen plus for information about healthcare disparities in the LGBTQIA plus cancer community, the impact of cancer diagnosis, and ways to manage challenges that may occur during treatment. Our blogs also offer real stories from members of the LGBTQIA plus breast cancer community, including Jay Truscosti's experiences in dealing with fears and finding support, and how Allison Gruber has learned to live in compassion for herself and others. You will receive links by email after the program so you can share this information with your patients and colleagues. After learning from Drs. Cortina and Sanchez today, we know you'll want to join us for the next session in this two-part webinar series, Developing Strategies to Support Mental Health in the LGBTQIA Breast Cancer Community. This session on Thursday, September 28th from 2 to 3.15 p.m. Eastern Time will feature psychotherapist Cassandra Falby and patient advocate Victoria Seaman. To learn more, please visit lbbc.org backslash inclusive hyphen care. We hope you'll join us for the conclusion of this two-part series on the 28th. Now let's move on to a few final details before the presentation. Today, we'll be using the chat to connect during the program, and you'll see the icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be using the Q&A feature. Please submit questions at any time during the program for our speakers. We ask that you frame your questions so they can be helpful to all participants. Our speakers will respond to as many questions as possible after the presentation. You can also set up closed captioning by going to the button at the bottom of your screen. We'll be emailing you a link to an evaluation after the program. Your feedback is very important to us in planning future webinars, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your input. Now, just a few words about contact hours and CEs. This activity was approved by Montana Nurses Association, an accredited approver with distinction by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation for 1.25 contact hours. It was also approved by the National Association of Social Workers for one CE and by the Patient Advocate Certification Board for one JEDI CE. If you've registered to receive contact hours or CEs, you're required to participate in the entire live webinar and complete the evaluation by September 27th. You will then be emailed your continuing ed certificate by October 25th. Certificates of participation will also be available upon request for providers from other disciplines. None of the planners or presenters for this educational activity have relevant financial relationships to disclose with ineligible companies, except for our program's nurse planner, Lori Ranallo, who's been a speaker for CGEN and Myriad Genetics. All of the relevant financial relationships listed for this individual have been mitigated. 
We are recording this session and we'll post it on the program webpage in about a week. We'll notify you via email when the recording is available. Our objectives for today's program are to help healthcare providers understand barriers to equitable care experienced by the LGBTQIA cancer community and impact on health outcomes, considerations in clinical care for LGBTQIA patients, the importance of gender, excuse me, the importance of inclusive and gender affirming healthcare environments, how to develop trust with LGBTQIA patients and their families, and best practices for creating welcoming spaces within your healthcare settings. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chandler Cortina, Assistant Professor and Chief of the Surgical Oncology Breast Service at Froder and the Medical College of Wisconsin. A Louisiana native, Dr. Cortina completed his residency at Rush University Medical Center and Cook County Hospital, followed by a fellowship in breast surgical oncology at Northwestern University. Dr. Cortina is actively engaged in clinical outcomes research and has authored over 50 manuscripts. His current research focuses on breast cancer risk, screening, and treatment in gender diverse populations, as well as investigating the impact of gender affirming care on risk and treatment recommendations. Dr. Cortina's research is supported by grants from PCORI, the MCW Clinical and Translational Science Institute, and the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment. Dr. Cortina maintains active involvement in various surgical and oncological societies and holds committee positions in the Society of Surgical Oncology, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, and the Central Surgical Association. Dr. Cortina, we're happy to have you with us today. It's also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julian Sanchez, a colorectal surgeon and the section chief of colorectal oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center. He is an associate professor of surgery and oncology at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine. Dr. Sanchez specializes in surgical care and prevention of colorectal and anal cancers, and he oversees the anal dysplasia program and the LGBTQ cancer program. His research focuses on health disparities and cancer screening programs among sexual and gender minority and Latinx patients, for which he has received several funded research grants. Dr. Sanchez is a member of the Society of Surgical Oncology, a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, and a board member of the International Anal Neoplasia Society. He serves on the National Comprehensive Network Panel for Cancer in Patients with HIV and on the Colorectal Committee for the Society of Surgical Oncology. Welcome, Dr. Cortina and Dr. Sanchez. Please join us on screen to share your presentation. I'll now turn things over to you. Great. Thank you, Stephanie, for the invitation and for putting on such a, a great uh, opportunity for us to talk today. Um, today, we're going to obviously discuss cancer among patients who are self-described as LGBTQI+. And I know it's a mouthful, so we will probably intermingle this long acronym with gay or sexual gender minorities throughout our talk, but please know we're talking about the same population. Um, we hope that this will touch a little bit on breast cancer, but also other cancers that really affect this community at large. Dr. Cortina, we'll start. So um, here are our disclosure and our funding reports um, to go ahead and report there. Um, and uh, Dr. Sanchez, do you want to just kind of go through our overview before we get started? Sure. So the first thing we're going to talk about, as I mentioned before, is this acronym and the terminology uh, of how and who we're talking about. Because part of the discussion that we'll lead today will really remain, will, uh, rely on making the patients feel comfortable. And a lot of that means having the patients self-describe their own identity. We'll go over some national level data and see how that applies to our specific patient populations and talk about barriers that these patients will address uh, when needing care. We'll talk about some implicit bias within the system and what we can do to support our patients. Lastly, we'll talk about some screening treatment options and outcomes among this population and identify some gaps and future opportunities for us to advance the needle in this group. So to go ahead and get us started, um, to help us define terms, um, we're going to use this gender-bred person. This is available online as an interactive tool. Um, but it's really important to understand that gender identity, attraction, um, biological sex, and gender expression are all very different things. So identity is really how you and your head experience and define your gender. 
Um, and this is based on how you may or may not align with the um, options for gender and your sex you were assigned at birth. And this is different from attraction, which is how you find yourself feeling drawn or not drawn to other persons in sexual romantic ways. And then sex, usually sex assigned at birth, are the physical traits that you're born with or develop that we typically think of as sex characteristics or sex organs, um, as well as the sex you were assigned at birth. And this is different from uh, expression. And this is expression is how you present your gender through actions, clothing, and demeanor, just as some examples, um, and how these presentations are viewed or perceived to others based on societal expectations. And whenever you think of gender identity, um, we think of this as manness to womanness. And gender expression is kind of on the spectrum of femininity and masculinity. But I think it's important whenever we're discussing these terms to really understand that these are really spectrums um, and people can really identify anywhere along um, gender identity or gender expression uh, spectrums. It's also key to understand that identity is does not, it's not the same as expression. These are all independent of one another. Um, sometimes there may be associations that might characterize people into certain groups, but overall, these are very different things. Now, some common sexual attract attraction terms that probably many of you have heard about, but just to review them for completeness sake today, um, gay identifies men who are attracted to other men. Um, lesbian is a term commonly used to identify women who are attracted to other women. Bisexual is usually used uh, for individuals attracted um, to both sexes. Asexual are individuals um, who have little to no attraction to others. And then straight are individuals who are generally attracted to the opposite sex only. Now, common gender identity terms um, so transgender men, or TGM, which is sometimes used in this presentation, are individuals who are assigned female sex at birth and identify as men. This is different from trans women who were assigned male sex at birth but identify as women. Some individuals um, identify as non-binary, which is really an identi identity elsewhere along the gender spectrum, usually kind of somewhere in the middle. People who are gender fluid identify with a gender that is not really fixed, it changes over time, um, meaning perhaps they identify as a man, but maybe sometimes identify as non-binary, and so they might consider themselves gender fluid. And then cisgender or cis, which is often used, is whenever someone's sex assigned at birth and gender identity are the same. Now, gender affirming therapy is something else that will, you might hear throughout this presentation. So gender affirming hormone therapy is typically with estrogen for trans women, testosterone for trans men, and can also include other medications like spironolactone. These are often long term or lifelong. Specifically to breast cancer or breast, um, there is data from the Netherlands demonstrating that once trans women start estrogen therapy, we actually do see clinical breast tissue to develop in around nine to 12 months. Now, some individuals may undergo gender-affirming surgery, and examples of gender-affirming surgery are chest masculinization surgery or top surgery for trans men. This is a, a really great um, cosmetic example of someone assigned female at birth who underwent top surgery and has a more masculine chest. Um, individuals may undergo chest augmentation, such as top surgery for trans women. Um, they may undergo bottom surgery um, to alter their, um, their genital ur urinary organs. Um, and there are several other uh, procedures that can also be performed. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sanchez. Sorry, I was muted. Rookie mistake. So who are these people and how uh, often are we seeing them? And if you look at the numbers across the country, about 7.1% uh, of the United States population self-identifies as gay. Now, the interesting thing is if you break this down by different generations, you can see that the younger generations are much more comfortable with this terminology than the older generations, which kind of makes sense if you start polling patients. So let's break it down by generations. And we can see among millennials, about 9% self-identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community. 
and about 16% of the most recent Gen Z uh, population self-identifies in this group. Um, in my local area here in, in the Tampa Bay, Mid Florida region, about 4% of the region. And that's largely because we're an older population. And in my, pop in my group of patients, they're generally skewed to an older age, so we're less likely to self-identify because they grew up in a different era. Now, the important thing about it is that all major medical institutes, including the NIH, the National Cancer Institute, the American Medical Association, and the Institute of Medicine have all described this group as a health disparity or group. What that means is it allows us to apply for funding like Dr. Cortina and I have had in the past to research this population because we know they have, they suffer from diminished health outcomes. Slide. So if you look here throughout the time, we can see that as time goes on, we have more and more patients self-identifying as LGBTQ plus members. Some of this has to do with polling data, but a lot of it has to do with change in social stigma. It's more legal now, let's say, for patients to self-describe to self in this population because there's less social stigma against being in the closet. Again, as we look at the different generations, we can see that the more recent or younger generations are more prone to self-describe as LGBT. This also means that there's more gender fluidity among the younger populations. So not only are they more willing to self-describe, but there's also much more same-sex behavior among the younger generations than there was among the older generations. So even if you start asking patients, well, even if you describe a straight, how often are you having same sexual encounters? And more patients in the younger generations are self-describing themselves as straight, but still experiencing same sex gender experiences or sexual experiences. Now in clinical practice, it doesn't much matter what you call yourself, it really matters what you do. So for instance, in my world where I treat mostly anal cancer, I really care about who you're having sex with and where you're having sex. The label is essentially unimportant to me from a medical standpoint. It's all about what organs you're using for what. So in this population, it's really important to ask more than how are you describing yourself, but how are you having sex? So whenever we talk about healthcare disparities that exist for sexual and gender minority populations, um, we do see discrimination in healthcare, unfortunately. We also know that these individuals are less likely to seek routine healthcare and cancer screenings. Um, there's a lack of data on in the impact of gender affirming therapies and cancer screening risk and treatment. And we also unfortunately know that there are higher rates of assault and violent crimes for these individuals, homelessness, financial hardship, and suicide and self-harm. Now, whenever we really focus on discrimination in healthcare, um, discrimination can be explicit or implicit and be by either by health systems or directly by healthcare providers. And this is actually the most cited reason why SGM individuals avoid seeking medical care or undergo recommended healthcare screenings. And negative experiences can often occur as a result of microaggressions by healthcare professionals. And some of these are intentional, some of them, are, these are not intentional, but nevertheless, um, they are, have a negative impact on our patients. And these are things like failing to recognize a person's gender, failing to use their chosen name and our pronouns. And sometimes you might hear people say that I was dead named, meaning that you called them by the their name that they were assigned at birth rather than the name that they currently use. Um, and same thing with pronouns. And it's important that we as clinical providers um, really provide inclusive and safe spaces for all of our patients. And this means um, providing appropriate changing rooms and locker rooms. So, you know, I work in a breast care center. Um, we have common locker room areas that women can change. Um, but for patients who may not identify as women or feel uncomfortable changing in a public space, we do have a separate space or separate locker room area um, that any individual um, can use. And it's also important to offer restroom spaces that are either private um, or that people can use based on their current identified gender. Now, reg specifically regarding oncology, um, a national survey that was conducted a couple of years ago, and this was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, I believe, they surveyed um, oncology practitioners around the country and found that a lot of practitioners felt that they really 
needed more help or more knowledge about the needs of LGBTQ plus patients. And over 65% actually reported that they were interested in having more education. And so I think this really identifies that, you know, we know this now and have for a while that we as healthcare providers aren't doing, don't know as much as we think that we do and really need more education in this space to, to do better for our patients. Um, now the same survey, and Dr. Sanchez is gonna elaborate on this in a little bit, um, but on practice intake forms, so meaning the forms people get whenever they register for an appointment to see you, or perhaps are a part of their packet of information that they receive whenever they do see you, when soliciting information from patients, um, the majority of participants in this in this survey found that their practice intake forms did not include data collection on sexual orientation, um, ask individuals to identify specifically the sex they were assigned at birth, or identify their gender identity. And this this is this is problematic for in a few different ways. In that you know what we're recording from patients or getting from them on their intake forms may not be entirely accurate about how they actually are whenever they are seeing you that day. So that was uh, actually a, a nice excerpt of some of the research that we had done here. And uh, we actually, what we did is we asked our common providers here at our medical center, which is only an oncology center. And we asked them, well, how much do you know about this population? And how much do you still need to know about this population? And it was really interesting to get some of the results. Remember, these are all academic, oncologists at a university setting at an NCI designated cancer center. So these should be the top so many percent of oncologists in the country, and they should be living the gold standard. But when we asked them that how often they're inquiring about their sexual orientation, the vast majority said that it doesn't matter, they don't ask. And they thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were helping the patient by uh, having some uh, degree of anonymity or some degree of not prying into their sexual history. But in reality, they were doing the wrong thing when only 27% of our uh, clinicians here at our medical center actually actively asked about sexual orientation. So then we said, well, this can't be a problem just unique to our hospital. I mean, maybe we are doing things wrong and everybody else is doing them right, but let's, let's get a better idea. So then we polled all oncologists who are part of the National Cancer Institute, and we polled everybody and their numbers were almost exactly the same as what we were seeing here. So then we said, well, this is obviously a, an oncology or a provider specific problem, but why are providers not asking? So then we said, well, maybe the guidelines aren't right, right? So then what we did is we pulled the National Cancer, the Comprehensive Cancer Network panel. So for those of you who are familiar, the NCCN is a, a body made up of several different experts in several different cancers who come up with the rules, let's say, of how the United States should treat different cancer sites. So there's a panel for breast, there's a panel for colorectal, there's a panel for melanoma and so on and so forth. And there's members who make up this panel of physicians who kind of outline the definition of what it is that the United States is gonna to use to treat specific cancer. So then we ask the members of these panels and we say, in your panels, are you recommending that we ask about uh, sexual orientation and gender identity? And surprisingly, they weren't. 84% of the panels did not think that sexual orientation was relevant. This includes, unfortunately, some of the panels that we know sexual orientation plays a large role in that cancer development. 94% that said that gender identity was irrelevant. And 77% of all of the panels in the United States that essentially define how we treat cancer in this country do not address LGBT cancer issues. So obviously the problem is not a local problem, but is much more a national problem. Next slide. So what are some ways around it? How do we help clinicians and how do we help patients feel more comfortable? Obviously, some of this is going to come with physician education, physician guidance, and changing some of these national organizations. Secondly, we have to create a welcoming space for the patient, and that take, makes the patient feel welcome in our area and also remind the clinician that there are patients who will fall outside the norm of their typical patient they see. So some of the things that we do here is that we try to use gender neutral language in recruitment and enrollment. 
So when we enroll patients and recruit patients, we want to make sure that our advertising is not gender specific. I can give you a great example. And I'll go through this probably in a little bit in a different slide, but we um, just built a brand new hospital. So in this brand new hospital, we had, it's all surgical and we were looking at the different spaces and we said, okay, so how do we, you know, make the breast center um, more inclusive? Well, the first thing is that the breast center used to be called the women's center. So if you were a person who had breast cancer, but did not identify as a woman, you automatically didn't feel like you fit in. You automatically felt like you were an outsider, like you were somebody else in a space that you did not belong. So instead of it calling the women's center in the new hospital, we changed it to gender neutral language. And now it's the breast center, just like the melanoma center, just like the sarcoma center. So with this, we made patients feel more comfortable. Next. We have gender inclusive forms. So now our forms do not just say, are you a man or a woman? Check one of the two boxes. Now it's a box for female, a box for male, and a box for open uh, um, discrimination for the patient to say exactly how they self-identify. We have rainbow stickers throughout our hospital. Now it's interesting because this actually put up a lot of uh, argument in our hospital, the equality sign and the rainbow sign. And what we found, we actually polled patients who were not members of the, S of the sexual gender minority community. And we say, would you be offended? I mean, I, I live in a very conservative part of the country. And we said, would you be conservative? Would you be concerned if our hospital had a rainbow flag at the bottom of the, of the entrance sign? And most patients that knew what it meant said, no, they didn't care. Some patients had no idea what it meant and obviously didn't care because they didn't know what they're looking at. So in, in essence, few people are going to be offended by this, but the amount of people you're going to help by making them feel much more welcome is outstanding. We train our staff with research and clinical. So when they call patients, we tend to ask the patients to self-identify very early in a conversation. Um, when patients come to the, to the patient check-in area, uh, they're not saying, hello, Mr. or hello, Mrs. They're just saying to the patient, hello, Bob or hello, Janet, whatever their EMR says. And we have very inclusive information. So all of our pamphlets, all of our electronic media has all been eliminated for gender bias. So we try to make everything as open as possible so that everyone feels like the information we're trying to portray really applies to them. And lastly, we made gender neutral bathrooms. I told you that we designated that we designed this whole new hospital. And what we did is we tried to have a traditionally male bathroom, traditionally female bathroom, and a gender neutral bathroom all within the same area. So it's easily identifiable. And a patient who was looking for the restroom or asked for the restroom did not have to go out of their way to look for a, a gender neutral bathroom. We have the verbal uh, visible non-discrimination poster and it's part of our intake forms as well where the patients can uh, understand our policies about non-discrimination. And we talked about provider education, how important it is uh, to tell the patients and to tell the providers to give adequate information in a non-biased way. So this is a little picture of how we ask the questions and SOGI stands for sexual orientation and gender identity. And it's kind of what we use in research to describe this population. And what we do is we ask patients, what is your current gender identity? The other thing important to know is that this is not a static one time you get asked this question and you never see it again. We have patients at our institution that have been patients at our hospital for 10, 15 years. The first time they asked us, we asked them, sorry, and now maybe two different answers. So this questionnaire is asked repeatedly throughout the patient's hospital stay and or hospital encounter with us. So we ask the patient, what is their gender, if they belong to a transgender community, or if they want an open-ended question. We ask, what is their assigned birth or their birth certificate? Now, some people will ask, why are we asking this? Why do we care? And the reason is because this goes into the second one question is, what is your official gender on government records? So whereas the patient may self-describe as female, it's important to me to treat the patient as female, but it's also important for me to know what their legal gender is because that's how we generate a bill. So if I generate a bill for a patient who self-describes as female and I bill for a female patient with a female name, the insurance may deny the bill, leaving the patient at risk to pay the bill. Now, if we ask the patient what their official governmental or insurance regulation uh, gender is, then we can bill appropriately. We also ask the patient the preferred name. So oftentimes, I mean, many of us have nicknames and many of us change our names throughout our lives. And it's very important in this population to use the same thing. It's important, especially when let's say you're coming out of anesthesia and we're waking you up and we're like, 
hey, Bob, hey, Bob, hey, Bob. Well, if you don't go by Bob, then you're not going to open your eyes. So the important thing is to identify what the patient's preferred name is so they, we can treat them appropriately, but also accurately. And lastly, we ask about their, their sexual orientation. Again, who do they have sex with? Again, that helps us identify not only the patient, but also how to treat them appropriately. When we get these answers, we want to be sure we structure them in a good way. Now, most days, everyone is using electronic medical records, but it was surprisingly difficult when we started this project to get that questionnaire that I just showed you onto an EMR, the electronic medical record, in a usable format. It was very difficult to make that transition. Finally, we were able to do so. And it allows the patients to answer this question multiple times throughout their, throughout their hospital encounters and also allows us to identify patients where that we then can distribute in emails to those who need to. So let's say we have a patient who self-identifies as transgender and that patient noted on the form that he or she would like someone to reach out to them to talk to them before their first visit about experiences they may encounter as a transgender patient new to our institution. So that then will get flagged, sent to the social workers who would then re reach out to that patient before their first visit, before setting, stepping foot onto this hospital and say to them, hey, listen, you reached out, you had a question, you were concerned, let me walk you through our transgender policies. Let me walk you through how that first visit is going to go, and I can join you if you want. It allows us to pre-screen patients in a safe and reliable way so that we can get the patients they help they need before they fall into problems. We also organize a recruitment plan. We have the patient, uh, especially when it comes to research, uh, provide an information about the research project. The coordinator would then come in and provide any services that patient would need in helping them recruit for a study or participate in any clinical activities. Next slide. So when a patient first comes to see us, What's the difference? So how do I treat an LGBT patient different from a non-straight or a straight patient, let's call it? Um, the first thing is that we take a history as we've described. Um, on the EMR, oftentimes the patient has not legally changed gender. So when that happens, our EMR has a pop-up that'll say this patient self-identifies as Mary, even though the EMR says her name is Bob. She self-identifies as a female, even though the EMR self uh, says that Mary is a male a pop-up and our screen would then show up. And this pop-up would alert the clinician or the nurse or the MA or whoever is really in taking this patient and say, Mary and Bob are essentially the same person, but this is the pronouns and this is the name that Mary wishes us to use. That way it's not an awkward coming out every time this patient steps foot in our door and sees four different people throughout their visit to see us on an outpatient stay, everyone is on sharp, everyone is on task, and everyone understands that Mary is who she says she is. It's also important in this population to take a good medical reconciliation and identify what medicines this patient is on. When the patient comes to our hospital and is on some kind of hormone therapy, and let's say I do something different for them, let's say I take out their colon for colon cancer, but the patient's transgender, if we take a good medical history and if we identify their medications, I will know to continue their medications in the post-operative period as they need to. Now, again, this is kind of highlighted, and I have to kind of give a legal disclaimer depending on your state. Um, in our state right now, this is illegal for us to do this. It really depends on your state. And I have to uh, kind of advise you to talk to your uh, hospital legal counsel to see if you can do this in your state or not. Um, the next thing where this comes into play in my world as a surgeon is in the pregnancy policy. And I'll give you a little example of this. I was doing a surgery on a patient who is a, was a, trans, is a transgender woman, and she had legally changed her gender and her name to female. So she comes in for surgery and on the EMR, it said female, I had a female name. So our hospital policy says that all women of this age to this age need a pregnancy test. Well, this patient was incredibly embarrassed when we said to her, you need a pregnancy test. And then she said, well, I was born a male. And that was just a little bit of anxiety and just a position that we didn't really feel comfortable or a conversation that we needed to have right before a major operation. It just really wasn't top level care. So what we did is we changed our, our policy and we kind of went with what the American Society of Anesthesiology says is really pregnancy tests for anybody of childbearing potential, regardless of what gender you are, regardless of what gender you were, regardless of anything. It really just depends. Do you have the mechanism in your body to have a baby? And if you do, then you need a pregnancy test. If you don't, then we don't need a pregnancy test. So something as simple as changing the wording really made a big impact in our patients' lives. 
We also try to really limit the curiosity and the chatter. Um, you know, if it, I don't know how most hospitals are set up, but ours is set up with like these paper thin little curtains between some of the words, between some of the rooms in the preoperative area. And it's really interesting that we are quiet and we're not kind of shouting out from the rooftops about this patient. We really just try to respect the patient's privacy at all times. The last thing to remember is that what is called normal in terms of laboratory functions may not be normal for that patient. So normal labs for say masculine and feminine, depending on their gender at birth may differ depending the patient's hormonal status or surgical status. So we can't necessarily go by what the lab says may be normal or abnormal. Next slide. So during their inpatient stay, the next thing we kind of phase of their care is that we need to continue their thromboembolism prophylaxis. So after surgical patient, after surgical surgery, patients are at higher risk for having DVTs. Patients on hormones have even a higher risk of DVTs. So we want to be sure that while they're inpatient, we carefully accommodate for this and include VTE prophylaxis as part of their standard postoperative care. Again, we continue their hormones as the law allows, and we get proper sign out. So when the same patient, Mary goes from the PACU and start, goes to the post-surgical floor for the rest of her recovery, those nurses sign out to each other and say, Mary goes by Mary. Her EMR says that her name is Bob, but she goes by Mary and she's a female. And that way, that awkward coming out when Mary just had surgery is avoided. We let patients and their family members describe who they want to inform. And I usually clear this with the patients preoperatively. And I say, okay, Mary, who do you want me to tell of your surgery and what do you want me to tell them? That way the patient has complete autonomy over the story and the narrative that I give to their family members or friends that may be waiting for them. At our hospital, we have all single rooms, so we kind of avoid this, thankfully, but at some hospitals where there's multiple patients per room, we want to assign patients by gender identity, depending on your hospital policy. If your hospital does not have a gender assigning policy, then maybe it's time to start investigating making one. And we get early consults. As I mentioned before, we have we generate kind of lists among the group of us who, who treat these patients, and we share this with the social workers and case managers to get these patients to consult with the necessary social services that they may need to help them in the recovery phase of their care. Next slide. Then while we're in surgery, it's also important that we maintain some awareness of what these patients may be undergoing. We talked about their risk of DVTs, which is about 20% higher than a patient who has not transitioned. Uh, we talked about continuing uh, VTE prophylaxis and uh, heparin and se sequential compression devices. What's interesting, though, is that not only the surgeons have uh, sometimes a harder time taking care of post-surgical uh, post patients, but also our anesthesia colleagues do as well. Oftentimes, patients who have undergone some transition operations will have laryngoplasty to shave uh, the voice box and the Adam's apple, so to speak, to soften the voice. And when that happens, they can get strictures on the airway. So it's important for us to convey this to our anesthesia colleagues that intubation may be a little bit more difficult because of a post-surgical airway and strictures that may have developed. The same thing when it comes to the urethra. After bottom surgery, some patients have urethral strictures that may make your Foley insertion more difficult. So we want to be aware that when you know the nurse is putting in or I'm putting in the Foley, we are cognizant that this is a post-surgical urethra and that we may encounter some strictures along the way. Next slide. So kind of going back into some of those disparities that we see for SGM populations, um, you know, the goal of cancer screening is to really detect disease that's asymptomatic for earlier treatment in order to help support sur for survival. And we see this a lot for breast cancer, cervical cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, and prostate cancer. And given um, the nature of this talk today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of information around breast, can around breast cancer screening in SGM individuals. Um, so we know that cancer screening for cervical, breast, and prostate cancer is much lower in SGM populations compared to cisgender populations. Um, this is data from the Health Information National Trend Survey database back from 2017 through 2019. Um, I forget the exact number of people who uh, took the survey, but I believe it was over 500 American adults. And what they actually found is whenever they were looking at cervical cancer screening or a pap smear, um, breast cancer screening with mammography, and then a PSA blood test or prostate cancer screening, um, they actually found that individuals who identified as bisexual or gay or lesbian had not just a visible 
lower likelihood of having undergone cancer screening, but this was actually statistically highly significant. And this really tells us that there's a real opportunity for us as healthcare providers to do a better job in promoting and understanding uh, cancer screenings and SGM populations. Now, we did a survey here, um, and we, uh, we surveyed about a, a little over 100 trans individuals um, about perceptions around cervical and breast cancer screening. And, you know, we identified that over 35% were concerned about developing a breast cancer, and over 40% were concerned about developing cervical cancer. Um, however, in those individuals over the age of 40, Unfortunately, only 50% um, had reported actually undergoing a screening mammography with, for breast cancer before. And this number was actually pretty similar in cervical cancer for individuals who still had a cervix um, who had received any sort of screening in the uh, five years prior. And unfortunately, what this results in is um, not just diagnostic delays, but it also results in cancer outcome issues. So this was a single institution study done through Stanford, and it was retrospective, meaning they went and they looked at patients who had been diagnosed um, in the past. And they, what they did is they went through their medical charts and they found individuals who identified as a sexual or gender minority um, with a breast cancer diagnosis. And they had 95 patients um, over, I believe, a time, time frame of about 10 years, um, I think, the majority identified as lesbian, and then about 5 to 10% identified as non-cisgender. And then they found a comparable match of individuals who identified as cisgender and heterosexual, who were the same age, same race, um, same sex assigned at birth, and had the same type of breast cancer, meaning similar stage and similar disease profile. And what they actually found is that patients who identified as SGM um, actually had a longer time to initial diagnosis and actually, unfortunately, also had inferior survival compared to cisgender individuals. And so this leads us to a lot of questions about, again, well, what can we be doing as healthcare providers to help mitigate some of these disparities and do better for our SGM individuals? Now, unfortunately, you know, regarding breast cancer screening, there's not any um, clear guidelines from currently, at least, from the American Cancer Society or the United States Preventative Task Services. Um, although several organizations around the country do offer some recommended kind of expert level guidelines, um, there is some data to support these, but unfortunately, the recommendations are a little bit all over the place. Um, and really not evidence-based. Here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we try and follow the UCSF guidelines. It's what we um, generally use, and these are shared decision-making um, between our um, primary care providers and, um, S and uh, SGM people. Interestingly, in 2021, the American College of Radiology for Breast Cancer actually said, we need better guidelines, we need something to help support um, patients and providers in determining what are going to be the best options for screening, particularly amongst um, trans, non-binary, and gender diverse individuals. And so they actually released, and this is available online, you can literally Google ACR appropriateness criteria for transgender breast cancer screening and find this PDF very quickly. Um, the link is down there on the bottom of the screen as well. But this does provide eight different gender scenarios. Um, they call them variants, which is just the terminology they use. Um, but these have different um, ages as well as um, gender transitions. And they discuss different breast screening procedures um, that can be considered for these individuals. And then they also discuss about, well, what's the, what do we think is a consensus group from the American College of Radiology is probably, is usually appropriate, maybe appropriate, or usually not appropriate. And this is really consensus kind of expert level data. There's not a tremendous amount of, um, of evidence-based data to support this. But again, this, serves as, this can serve as a great guide whenever um, you're working with patients and trying to understand what's the best way to screen them for breast cancer. 
So when we look at the research, and you know, research really guides the way we treat uh, these patients, we can see that unfortunately, the research in this group is not really helping us a whole lot, only because there's a lack of it. So when you look at all the clinical trials between 1991 and 2017, there were 764 clinical trials, main, major clinical trials, that led to an FDA approval of a drug or a change in, a onco in oncology or a change in a chemotherapy use. These are all some of the major trials that we have in our world, in our field. Of the 764 trials, none of them reported a subpopulation analysis on SGM patients or patients because of their, their LGBTQ plus status. So although we may, may know how these drugs work in straight men and straight women, we have no subset analysis to identify how they work in this specific population. Next slide. Um, so overall, there's a lack of retrospective data on these, on these patients. So it really doesn't give us a lot of information on how we change our clinical practice respective to these patients. So in my world, let's say of HPV-associated cancers, we don't have, well, now we have a little bit better data, I would say, but we don't have major cross-populational data on how HPV testing among non-binary or members of the SGM community should be any different than patients who consider themselves cis straight. So when we look at the different studies, especially the one here done by Dr. Cortina, we can see that the in tumor registries, which is how we kind of account for patients and how we follow patients lifelong to identify if that cancer treatment was adequate or not, that there hasn't been a whole lot of inclusion of these patients in these large registries. That calls on us to raise the baton and start including these patients in our registries and in our clinical studies so that we can further gain more information about them and identify if there's any changes that we need to do, either in dosing or in medication or even in screening, to accommodate for some of the increased cancer risks and poor outcomes we see. And so overall, there's really a lack of data on the impact of gender-affirming therapies in cancer screening, risks, and treatment. And so, like Dr. Sanchez was just kind of discussing, there really is a lot of different opportunity um, for us as a, as a healthcare and medical community um, to do better for SGM patients. And so it's important that whenever we think about database and clinical trial inclusion, that we really collect gender separate from sex assigned at birth and make that part of study design. So whenever you're thinking about, you know, designing a study and what different patient aspects you're going to collect, think about that as an opportunity to include those sorts of things. I think it's also really important to allow participants to voluntarily report their gender and sexual preference, but not be obliged to report that. Um, it's really important not to force people to help themselves and for them to feel comfortable disclosing that information if they desire. Um, if we have that data, it's great, but we don't want to do that at the expense of having um, of having patients not want to participate in studies or not get appropriate health care. Um, and then in thinking about including and collecting use of gender-affirming hormone therapy and any gender-affirming operations individuals may have. And it's really up to us to really think about developing novel prospective clinical studies to answer these questions. And these needs to be done in collaboration with SGM patients. So I think it's important that, um, that whenever we're designing these trials or designing these studies, that you talk to members of the community, whether they be in your institution, um, through an outreach group. Um, here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have a collaborative work group amongst basic scientists, um, clinicians, healthcare researchers, um, as well, and, along with um, several um, community organizations that um, advocate for SGM individuals. We have a group of about 20 of us. And so, you know, we usually meet about once every um, two to four weeks to kind of discuss what's going on, um, how we can improve our current studies, how we can improve current clinical care, um, and how we can think about moving things forward over the next few months. Dr. Sanchez? No, oh, sorry. Um, so when we look at this general population as a whole, um, we talked about how often or how prevalent the population is in our everyday work as clinicians, but we also have to identify that these patients have higher cancer rates. The higher cancer rates are multifold. So the higher cancer rates sometimes are due to exposure, let's say HPV, for instance. Some of them are due to higher exposure because of hormones, as we had previously discussed. 
but also some of them have higher cancer rates because of other behaviors. So let's say in the lesbian population, we know that lesbian women are more prone to smoking than straight women are, so they have higher smoking-associated cancers. Uh, gay men have higher sun-seeking behaviors, and living in Florida, we see more melanoma in gay men than we see in straight men. So some of these cancer rates are due to the population, their medication, or their behavior. Unfortunately, they're also the screening rates are much lower. So when we look at HPV-associated cervical cancer, even though lesbian women have less cervical cancer than straight women, they still have more overall problems with their cancer because they don't get as much screening and the cancer comes and is identified at a much later stage. These patients have higher chronic disease rates and like I said, lower screening. In general, the population also suffers from higher mental illness due to social problems that can lead to exacerbation of their cancer diagnoses. Next slide. So in summary, the SGM population is growing. As clinicians, we all need to be sensitive to their specific care needs and how we can play into that from an administrative standpoint, from a hospital standpoint, from a national standpoint, and from an individual clinician standpoint. We need to increase our use of gender-affirming therapies to, to identify the potential long-term health implications and how this weighs into their individual cancer risks. Sometimes it's a very simple change. As I mentioned, we change some intake forms. We change some hospital policies. We change the name of a building or of at least of a room. Doesn't seem like a whole lot, but makes a huge impact on the patients that you're affecting. Changing the hospital environment speaks volumes as to your commitment to this population and their comfort in getting care at your center. We provide uh, education for our providers and our clinicians, both at a local level and again at a national level by changing some of the screening guidelines to al allow clinicians to have the data they need to us adequately care for these patients. And we're including these patients in our prospective data collection, our large registries, our research, and then doing subset analysis and clinical design changes to allow us to later report on these populations so we can really assess how this cancer is impacting their life. So with that, we just wanted to thank you for your attention, and then we'll open up the questions. I see already three Q&As, so I think the first one is for me. Uh, was there pushback in changing the name from the Women's Center to the Breast Center? No, not really. It was kind of a no-brainer. Once I brought it up, to the people who named it, they weren't thinking the way I think as a person who kind of cares for this population with some frequency. So they were like, duh, you know, of course, this is a, a no-brainer. It actually was super easy. Um, no pushback whatsoever. It just, you're just... No one intently wants to do something wrong or so intently wants to hurt somebody. They just really want to make sure you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. And as soon as I highlighted that, it was a very easy change. Um, someone wrote, Kelly wrote, this is really fantastic. I hope that future criteria for all comprehensive cancer center designations by NCA offers LGBT plus practices. Yes, that's our goal is to have the NCCN or the NCI change all of our guidelines to at least address LGBT or SGM population issues. And so far, we've been able to get a couple of the panels to change. Some of the panels that I sit on now have specific SGM criteria or discussion in our panel guidelines. Next, by an anonymous person has recent policy changes in Florida affected healthcare providers. Um, it depends on, I don't know how I'm allowed to answer this question because I'm a state employee. So um, I have to disclose uh, to the state any discussions that I'm having um, any lectures that I'm having or any um, talks that I'm giving, such as this one, uh, regarding SGM care. We have to be very careful on what drugs, as I mentioned before, we can give patients and what age the patients are. Um, and I have to be very careful about who's funding some of my research. So from a state, um, the state wants essentially nothing to do with it, but we have federal funding at our disposal, which is kind of how my salary has been, has been changed to allow for me to continue this work locally. I guess I'll leave it at there and you can make your own inferences from there going forward. Um, Chandler, maybe you can uh, talk about hormone therapy. Yeah, which question is it? I'm it says, are, are yeah. use of hormone therapies contributing to an increased rate of cancer? So that's a million dollar question that we can't really answer right now because there's not any large retrospective um, data here in America that can really elucidate that. There is some data from the Netherlands showing that um, uh, trans individuals who are on gender-affirming hormone therapy for a number of years um, and trans men who take testosterone, 
it usually looks like it looks like their incidence is probably lower than cisgender, the cis, cisgender women population. Um, whenever we talk about breast cancer in trans women, we actually see that the incidence appears to be higher than it is in cisgender men. We think that's from long-term estrogen exposure. However, the data is really soft with really wide confidence intervals for these incidence rates, and so it's not super clear. Um, we're trying to do some more work here, which I didn't get into today, in this space around uh, specifically breast cancer and gender-affirming hormone therapy and how it may or may not change that risk. Um, but unfortunately, we, there's just not enough data currently to answer those questions. Um, but I know people like myself and researchers around the country are trying to answer this moving forward. But more than likely, it's going to take a lot more time um, to get kind of long-term data. Right. I'm uh, monitoring some of the chat questions. And Anne uh, had, had a point that ASCO has several sessions on how to treat trans patients. I think not just ASCO, but may, many of the major surgical associations and oncology associations are following suit only because it's becoming a hot topic. And we're all realizing that we need to change the way we treat patients. So thanks to the discussion like we're having today. We've had, you know, Chandler and I have also participated in a similar discussion among us at Society of Surgical Oncology, the Colorectal Society, and the Breast Societies are also having very similar conversations just to get the word out there. We talked about how important it is to, for us to talk to our colleagues and peers about these issues who are not trying to do wrong, they just don't know. So all our job is to identify and teach them so they can do the right thing for the next patient. Yeah, I think most instances whenever we have these conversations um, in professional settings, a lot of people are just like, oh, I never thought of that. Or, oh, whenever I, I didn't think of this until I had a patient in the clinic who asked about this. And so I think a lot of healthcare providers, it's a lot of it isn't intentional. It's just, oh, I've never thought of that. Or, oh, we should be doing this. And we just, why aren't we doing it? And so I think over the past several years, there's been a lot of really great work in this space. And hopefully as we move forward, we continue to have more um, inclusive spaces for patients um, from both a clinical healthcare standpoint, but also from a research standpoint. Yeah, it's interesting. In that study that we had highlighted earlier about our uh, provider attitudes, one of the questions we asked the providers, which is kind of was really interesting in getting to this topic, is we asked the providers, do you treat your gay patients globally different than your straight patients globally? And they said, no, of course not. I treat every patient exactly the same. Well, that's the wrong answer. They were hoping that that was the right answer. They were saying, yeah, no, everyone, I'm blinded by everything. I'm blinded by race. I'm blinded by sexual orientation. I'm blinded by everything. I'm a great doctor, right? That's what we're taught in medical school. But the reality of the situation is because of what we've just been talking about, these patients are different and we need to treat these patients differently. And we need to tell the providers that not every patient's the same. Yeah, in our mind, we're not going to prejudice against somebody. That's the right answer. But the right answer is also that we're going to treat these patients differently because they have different needs. Let's see. Um, some people are kind of uh, giving shout outs to some of the research at their institutions and um, Stephanie, you have more questions, I guess. I do. Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, thanks so much. We um, actually had people submit questions ahead as they were okay. part of the registration. So I'd love to get to a couple of those as well. Sure. And I know that there have been more that have been coming into the Q&A. So just briefly before I get to that, I want to thank you both so very much for an incredibly informative uh, presentation obviously of huge interest to our audience and really important to their patient care. So we probably have about 10 more minutes for Q&A. Um, not surprisingly, probably some of the ones that came in before the program you've addressed already in this Q&A or just through the kind of content of your presentation. There were a couple of um, interesting ones that I wondered if either or both of you might comment on that go to the topics of, I'll start first with body image. Um, and what you see with your patients who are from the LGBTQIA plus community are also dealing with cancer that can create body image um, issues and, you know, kind of what are you seeing there? Any thoughts or, or recommendations that our audience might take away today? Um, I can start off and I, I imagine Dr. Sanchez is going to have some thoughts on this too. Um, so I, I exclusively care for breast cancer patients. Um, and I've taken care of several trans individuals over the past several years. Um, and it's a very interesting conversation. And I make it part of our discussion whenever we're deciding what approach they want to take for their breast operation. Um, so some of these individuals have already had or were identified, identified as trans men or non-binary and have already had top surgery and have a breast cancer that develops in some of their remaining tissue. Um, and then some individuals have not undergone top surgery. And so 
So my question is, well, what are their goals and what do they want to look like? Um, I had a young non-binary individual who developed a breast cancer who was a great candidate for a lumpectomy or breast conservation therapy. Um, and that's what they kind of came in um, thinking that was going to be their only option. And I said, no, you know, as part of your treatment, if you're interested, um, you know, if you're interested in having a, a top surgery of some, some sort, we can discuss options. Um, and they were very interested in having mastectomies and being flat. They also had a genetic mutation that also supported that clinical decision making. But from a body image standpoint, they were very happy to no longer have breasts. They definitely did not want reconstruction. They wanted to be as flat as possible so their pec muscles could show more. Um, and these are really important things to have as part of your, uh, as part of our surgical decision making and treatment considerations whenever we're meeting these patients. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I think it goes beyond this population, to be honest. Maybe I just live in a very superficial state where people are shirtless often, but people really have a lot of concerns about how they look like at the beach. And um, more so than that, patients have a lot of concerns about after effects of their treatment. So we give a lot of radiation, let's say, for cervical cancer, for anal cancer, for prostate cancer. And that does a great job at treating the cancer, but also unfortunately causes severe stricturing or scarring of the anal genital region. And if you use the vagina for sexual intercourse, you can get stricturing or stenosis of the vagina, making vaginal intercourse very difficult. If you use your anus for sexual intercourse, again, you can have severe stricturing and problems with sexual encounters because of the stricturing caused by the treatment we're providing. So part of my discussion for the patients is, yeah, we can treat your prostate cancer, we can treat your anal cancer with radiation, and you'll have an excellent success from a cancer standpoint, but realize your sexual uh, history, your sexual future is going to change a little bit because now that organ is going to be a little bit different, right? So you just have to counsel the patients. And most of the patients are willing for that trade-off. They'd rather kill the cancer and kind of change their sexual behavior in some degree. But you have to have that discussion beforehand so it's not catching them later and they're not really like, oh, I wish you would have told me that earlier. I think that goes for straights and gays, to be honest. Great. Thank you so much for commenting on that. Um, a couple other questions that came in uh, before today's program related to mental health. And I think, Dr. Sanchez, on one of your slides, you talked about um, perhaps a higher incidence or a high incidence of mental health challenges in this community of people who are of and also dealing with cancer. And just curious, again, if either of you could comment on that, have you um, addressed this through specific services within your centers that particularly target mental health? We do. So I mentioned a little bit how we uh, highlight patients who have self-identified on their intake form as a member of the transgender community. These patients are the ones we're targeting the most because they have the highest risk of mental health. So by age 18, 50% of transgender people will have at least thought, tried, or, or tried to uh, for suicide by age 18, 50%. Um, when you look at these numbers, they're staggering that so many patients are significantly depressed or significantly affected by their trans by their transitioning. So our job is to identify these patients very early. So what we do is we try to use our electronic medical record in our favor and identify the patients who are coming in as non-cis. The non-cis patients are then highlighted and contacted by a social worker who will then reach out to them, see what services they already have, see what questions they have, and see what services we can provide. Now, we're just a cancer center, so I don't have an on-staff psych psychiatrist, for instance, but we're well-connected with the community that we can give the patients some of the care that they may need. Even if it's not in our walls, we can refer them to somebody who may be able to help them. At the same time, it gives us a pretty good idea of who these patients are to give them strong social support for the patients who may not have the family and social support that other patients may have. Um, we have rideshare services, we have financial assistance services, we have um, a, a list of services that these patients may qualify for or may need that are different from the standard patient that we see every day. And here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we're really lucky. We're not just a cancer center, we're a fully comprehensive hospital system. Um, and here on our campus, we have a inclusion health clinic that was established about six years ago. Um, that specifically provides primary care and specialty care for SGM individuals. Um, luckily, through that system, there are several um, psychiatrists and psychologists, our mental health care, mental health experts. Um, and, you know, within our cancer center, we have some dedicated psychologists. But for those individuals who identify as SGM, we also 
definitely if they are interested in meeting with someone um, or having a mental health crisis, not only offer them the services we have in our cancer center, but also those we have in our inclusion health center. Um, but I know not every place has a center like that on their campus. We're just lucky to be honest. Great. Thank you very much for answering that, not only from kind of the mental health perspective, which is really, really important, but I appreciate also the mention of kind of resources and community resources, because I think that will speak a lot to many of the people that are on this um, call with us right now. And then um, another question that had come up, and you've just touched on it, and it's, it's I think, a particularly important one, is the issue of family. Um, and uh, how people define family. This is something we're also going to talk about more in our session in a couple of weeks on this overall broader topic. Is there anything else you can say about um, the family members, or chosen family or family of origin of the people who you are caring for or that you're seeing in uh, your centers, not only how they support their loved one who has cancer, but also um, just the impact of this whole experience on, on them? Yeah. Go ahead. And I was just going to say, you know, whenever whenever I meet cancer patients for the first time, I always pry into their so social history, right? So we're trained to ask the general, you know, smoking, tobacco, things like that. But I ask them, like, who are your people? Do you have a support system? Who is that support system? Can you lean on them? Can you can are they gonna, are they going to be able to help you with rides? Are they going to be able to help you at home? And for different people, family means different things, right? For some of those, for some of us, it's our chosen family. For some of us, it's the family that we've had since birth. But understanding who that family and support system is for that individual is really important whenever we're talking about all these things that go into cancer care, right? It's not just one appointment. It's, for lack of a better word, a bajillion appointments, bajillion radiation treatments you got to go to. You got to go to surgery. There's infusion. It's a lot of things that have to go on. And so I think it's really important to understand um, who their family is, who their support system is. And then I think it's okay sometimes too to have that uncomfortable conversation about finances. And if you ever take time off of work, how is that going to work for you? How can we help you um, in our center to not just treat you, but also make sure that whenever you are done with treatment, you're still able to, you're still able to have your life and have your job and have what makes you you um, without suffering any consequences. I think it's really important to go into each patient encounter pretty open. So kind of my standard, I teach the residents and the fellows the same thing is I walk into a room and I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Dr. Sanchez. I just look for whoever's wearing the band on their wrist. And I know that's the patient. Who are you? That right there allows the patient to say whether she's Bob or she's Mary. Then the patient tells me her name. And then I say, okay, nice to meet you, Mary. Who is everybody else in the room? And that allows Mary to then, in her own words, tell me her relationship to everybody else in the room. I think I learned that the hard way, especially in Florida, where the wife you think is the daughter and she's really the wife and you get really, really uncomfortable and it becomes super awkward. So in this case, what I do is I let the patient self-describe and the patient can say, this is the person who's going to pick me up. This is the person who's going to help me drive in the patient's own words. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also throughout all of this, how many kind of practical tips you have given to our audience that they can kind of use and, and take along with kind of the, the background information you've shared. So I think we have time for one last question and I, I don't see it. I can't see it now because my chat has moved, but I saw it kind of flit across the screen and it was about end of life care. Um, and I think it's, it's a really important one. So thank you to whoever um, added that and, and wondered if you could either or both of you could speak a little bit about end of life in this community of patients that you serve. I'm happy to talk. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I probably may experience a little more end of life, thankfully, or unfortunately, than you do, Chandler. But um, our patients often have, you have to have these discussions. I mean, I, I work in a major cancer operator, cancer center where we have these discussions daily. And um, it's, this is one scenario actually where you have to be very sensitive. Again, going to who these patients are really relying on and leaning on for their support. Um, and you want to be sure you're including these patients as part of the conversation alone. We tend not to have end of life decisions or conversations with the patient alone ever. Um, and we always include the patient's family in the conversations, regardless of whether they're members of the SGM community or not. When it comes to end of life within the SGM community, there's the added legal implications that you have to address. So in patients who are not legally married in our in my state the spouse does not have any legal rights because the state of Florida does not uh, allow for common law marriage 
So because of that, the patient and their family members need to come up with some kind of legal arrangement, right? And then at that point, we would get social worker case managers involved to help refer or not or supply the, the proper uh, legal help that patients may need to get this happening. Um, so those are all very difficult conversations that we have in the beginning. Um, more so, I think, than end of life is palliation in general. Um, palliation for us means many different things depending on what the patient's primary symptoms are. And as I mentioned before, for some patients who can no longer have vaginal intercourse or can no longer have anal intercourse, um, that's a significant quality of life decrease that we need to address in terms of their overall palliative uh, and support after their treatment, regardless of whether they're curative or not curative. For the non-curative patient, especially the ones who are going on to get hospice or going on transitioning to another facility, we need to be sure that the facility that they're going to has adequate handoff. Again, we talked about handoff between units in a hospital, between the pre-op, between the OR, and then later in the recovery floor, but also between institutions. So as we're transitioning a patient from, let's say, our acute care facility to a hospice facility, that handoff needs to occur at that moment too. Last thing you want to do is the patient is super stressed, the family is super stressed, the patient's dying, for them not to come out again, right? So our job is just to make that transition a little bit easier. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Dr. Cortina, is there anything you would want to add? Um, I was just going to say, I, 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 I Fortunately, I uh, don't have to deal with end of life issues too much, but um, Charles Kamen and Uwe Bomer are two PhD research scientists who have done a lot of work in SGM, um, uh, end of life care regarding cancer, as well as um, uh, um, spousal or partner support in, in going through a cancer diagnosis. And so I would encourage you guys to also um, look at some of the work that they've done because they're, they're they have some really informative um, pieces of work out there. Great, great. Thank you so much. So somehow it is already, at least in Eastern time, it's 12, 12. Um, so it's all the time we have for questions now. And on behalf of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, I want to thank you both so very much, Dr. Cortina, Dr. Sanchez, for your time and sharing your expertise and all of this valuable information with us today. It is greatly appreciated. And I really appreciate our audience as well. So you've been extremely engaged in the chat and asking questions. And that's a really important part of a program like this. So thank you. I want to again recognize the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for their support of this program. And a reminder to our audience that you'll receive an evaluation link today. Please, can, please remember to complete it no later than September 27th. And we'll also put the link in the chat for anybody who'd like to do it now. For those of you who request contact hours or CEs for nurses, social workers, or board certified patient advocates, or a certificate of participation, you'll be emailed your certificate by October 25th. We will also be sending a link to this program recording to all of you by the end of next week. So thank you again for joining us today and for the care that you provide to people affected by breast cancer. And one last reminder that we hope you'll join us on September 28th for the second session in this series. We're gonna pick up where we are and continue to build on some of these topics. That session is called Developing Strategies for Supporting Mental Health in Patients from the LGBTQIA plus Cancer Community. So thank you again, everybody. Please take good care and enjoy the rest of your day. This concludes today's program. You may disconnect at this time. Thank you for your participation.